Thank you for joining us today. I'm Pastor John Hogson. It's just great to have you with us. Here in a little bit, we'll hear a, a message from Pastor Sarah. And I just pray for each and every heart to be opened so that what she has to say will touch us in a very special way as she reads from, from God's holy word. And again, as she brings to us the message that God has given to her. But before we hear her message, I just want to pray for each and every one of us especially for those of you who have had your hearts broken recently by all of the things going on in this world. I pray that God will come to us, that God will comfort us, that God will give us a discerning spirit so that we can then go out into the world to bring God's good news of peace, of justice, and of love. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the God of the brokenhearted that you are the God of the lost, you are the God of those who have been despised and hurt. You are the God of the sinner, that you have come to us through your Son, Jesus Christ, to redeem us, to forgive us, to give us a new name and a new life. Dear Lord, we do pray for our world around us. We pray for your peace and justice to reign. We ask for your Holy Spirit to touch and refresh our hearts and our souls and our minds, especially we as the church, so that we can be your agents of change. Dear God, today may you remind us of our own sins, remind us of our own trespasses, and that it is only through Jesus Christ we have been redeemed. Dear Lord, come to us today and speak to us in a mighty way. Heal our land, heal our lives, heal your church, so that we can become your family. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless. Good morning and welcome to Faith Church. My name is Pastor Sarah Miller and I'm coming to you this morning at the beginning of a brand new sermon series. We are beginning today a sermon series based on the seven deadly sins. So starting next week, we're actually gonna look at each of the seven deadly sins and look to find a biblical solution. But today, we're gonna be talking about the problem of sin itself. Instead of getting specific, we're gonna start with sin as a whole and we'll get into each sin starting next week. So today our scripture verse comes to us from Romans chapter 3, verses 19 through 24. If you'd like to follow along, I'll be reading it out loud. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Holy Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, minds, and souls together be pleasing unto your sight, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, the problem of sin. This is a difficult topic and one, though, that I think is probably appropriate for this time that we find ourselves in. This fight that surrounds us, the the systemic racism, the political unrest, the hurt, the pain, the abuse, the frustration that seems to be running rampant. It is heavy and it is thick. And it is hard to stomach. Sin and evil are all around us. And we have to talk about sin. 
It's important for us as the church to discuss sin, to talk about what it is and why. Sin and evil are all over the place. And so we have to talk about it. We have to understand the problem of sin so that we can understand better why we believe what we believe. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about sin. So what is sin? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> sin is hard to define for sure. But I think the best uh, definition that we can use today is that sin is the opposition to all of God's good purposes for his creation. But let's talk a little bit more about what sin is as far as what scripture tells us. Scripture tells us that sin is everywhere. Sin is kind of ingrained in human nature. It's all around us. It's universal. Even our scripture this morning says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so that's us. We've all fallen short. None of us are perfect. Now, if we look at the scripture, we actually can pull apart the Old Testament and the New Testament. Old Testament was actually written in Hebrew. Now, I don't know Hebrew. I never took Hebrew, but I do know that there are four different words that we translate into words like sin or transgressions or iniquities. Four different words. So I'm going to just give you the definitions because I don't want to butcher the actual words. But the definitions begin like this. The first one that we're going to talk about means sin is missing the mark. Now, I've heard that one most often, that sin is about missing the mark or failing to reach your intention. You know, another one means incurring guilt or committing some sort of crime. A third definition in the Old Testament tells us that sin is a deliberate rebellion. And then there's a fourth, that sin is anything impure or unclean. So that's what the Old Testament defines as sin. But then the New Testament also has just one word we mostly use in the Greek, and that word means several different things, but most often it means failing, or it means rebellion, or it means disobedience. And truthfully, I don't think you can define sin by using just one of those definitions. I think it takes all of them together to understand the depth and the width of what sin is in our world. Sin is pervasive. It's everywhere. We can sin by what we think, by what we do, by what we say. We can sin accidentally. We may not even mean it subconsciously. We have no idea we're sinning, but we can still sin. We can even sin by not doing what we should be doing, sins of omission. You see, sin is pervasive. It's everywhere. And so when you add all these sin definitions together, we can see a better picture of exactly what it is. And so if we go back to that beginning, that earlier uh, definition I gave you, the one at the very beginning, sin is anything in opposition to God's good purposes in this world. You see, God is perfect. God is love. He is good. He is just. And sin is anything that's opposite of that. In our scriptures, in uh, Psalm 111, 7, it says, The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. We believe that God is good. And so sin is the opposite of that. So now that we know what sin is, what does sin do? For us as Christians to, that follow Christ, sin is offensive. Sin literally separates us from God. In Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2, it says, But your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. You see, when we sin, it is an opposition to God. It is a rebellion, an offense against God, and it separates us from a loving relationship with him. It literally cuts the binds of us and God, and it binds us to the sin itself. And the more unrepentant sin we pile on top of ourselves, the further we get from God. It creates a gap, a huge expanse that we can't get over. So sin separates us from God, but it also hurts others, and it hurts us. Sin marks us. It burns us. It creates scars on our hearts. It warps our view of reality. 
It literally erodes our souls. Sin is not to be messed with. It is not to be taken lightly. It burns us. You see, the seven deadly sins, part of the reason we're doing this scripture or this sermon series is that the seven deadly sins seem to be so innocent. We have a hard time defining sin. We've already talked about that. But often when we do talk about sin in church, it's always, like I said, something that's kind of out there. But the thing about the seven deadly sins is that they seem so innocent, so quiet, but truly they are very personal and they are very private. Pride, envy, anger, sloth, greed, gluttony, and lust, those are easily kept hidden and kept secret. They're so ordinary. They seem so simple. I mean, you turn on the news today and you, you see if all sorts of things that you can point to and say, now that's a sin, at least I'm not doing that, right? But then you look at this list of the seven and they don't look so bad, but that's exactly why they're dangerous. Because before you know it, you're wrapped up in these fingers of these, of these sins wrap around you and you are trapped. These seven, they lead to further sins, to deeper sins. They're the roots of things that are evil in this world. And they're so easily hidden. You see, even the world hands us these seven deadly sins on a silver platter. They're labeled and they are misconstrued as good things. For example, pride can be easily labeled as self-esteem. Envy can easily be handed to us as motivation to do better or to achieve higher standards. Anger is just when we are using our voices. Sloth is like rest and relaxation. Greed is looking out for yourself. Gluttony is indulgence or treating yourself. And lust, to be honest, is spoon-fed to us at every turn. If we want to talk about sin and talk about change in this world, big change, systemic change, we have to start and get internal. We have to start with what's in here, right inside of here. Because truly, the major threats to our humanity is not what's happening out here. It's what's happening inside each and every one of our own hearts. It's our carelessness, our prejudices, our own worries, our own hostilities, our selfishness, all of those things that are eating at us from the inside out that come out of us. That's what's causing problems in this world. Galatians 6, 7 through 8 tells us, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. But whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Friends, we have to call sin what it is. We have to call all of this what it is. We have to say it and we have to mean it. So I'll say it. I am a sinner. Me. I am a sinner. Jesus had no qualms about calling people sinners. He didn't step lightly. He didn't beat around the bush. Jesus just said it. But he can do that because he's God. If we want to call out racism, if we want to call out injustice, if we want to call out change, it has to first start with us and in our own hearts. I am a sinner. Me, I am a sinner. I can say it because I know it's true. The scripture tells us, our scripture today, that we can't be justified on our own. The law, the scripture, it doesn't save us. It can't save us. Even if I followed the law to the very letter, it just can't. I can't do all of that. I can't save myself. I cannot achieve my own salvation. So what am I supposed to do? I'm so broken. We're so broken as a humanity, as people. We are broken. We are sinners. But luckily, the scripture doesn't leave us there. Our scripture this morning, it says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness 
is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Through the law and through Jesus, looking at the gospel story, we're able to see ourselves as we are. By looking at scripture, by looking at Jesus, I recognize that I have come up short from Jesus's perfect example. That I am not worthy. But when I look at Jesus, not only does he show me that I'm not perfect by holding myself up against his example, but I see in him his death. I see the cross. I see his resurrection. And that shows me the perfect love. A depth of love so great that even death couldn't conquer. We have a God who is obsessed with saving sinners. Sinners like me. If you want to know what the problem of sin needs as a solution, it is Jesus, plain and simple. Jesus is the solution to the problem of sin because Jesus came to show us, to tell us that God loves us as broken and sinful as we are. And when we discover the revealed Christ, everything changes. When we have faith in Jesus Christ, we are justified through his work on the cross. We may be conscious of our sin. We may be able to see that we don't hold up to his perfect example, but because of Christ's work, it has no hold on us anymore. That sin that's in my life can be repented of and it doesn't hold me. I'm free. Our scripture this morning says it. It says that all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption of Christ Jesus. He did the work so that I might be free. So how do we deal with this internal sin? How do we deal with what's happening in our own hearts so that we might see a change in this world? I'm going to give you three things just really quick. Yes, we have a problem of sin. And Jesus is the solution. So the first thing we need is that we need to know the gospel. And I don't mean know the gospel, but with your head, I mean know the gospel in your heart. To understand the depth and the depravity of our own sin, where we are recognizing that it was me that was supposed to be on that cross. That was my punishment. That was my sin that put him there. And when I recognize that, that he died for me to save my life, to save my soul. When I feel it and know it in my heart, that's when change begins. The gospel can be summed up in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, when it says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Even as a sinner, I am a sinner, but Christ died for me. He took my place. He took my place. That was supposed to be me. He loves us that much. And so we must know the gospel because that's what our hearts need. That's what the world needs is to take that gospel message and share it with those around us. This is the time and the place where revolution, where revival can truly happen. Because it's the good news, the great news, the message of freedom that this world needs to hear. So step one, dealing with internal sin, know the gospel. And I mean know it. Number two is confess your sin. I want to see the world change. If we want to see change out here in the world, then it has to start with us. If we want to see freedom restored, if we want to see equality, if we want to see justice, then it has to start with our own hearts. And so we must, as we work and we are in communion with God, we must get down on our knees and repent of the sin in our hearts. We have to take real stock of what's going on in here, of our prejudices, of our racism, of all the things that are, that are swirling around in us. We have to confront it and we have to confess it, lay it bare in front of Jesus, lay it at the cross and leave it there. Repent, confess and repent. Turn around and away from our sin so that we can stand. 
We can stand in the forgiveness of Christ and try again. None of us are perfect. All have fallen short, but all freely receive God's justice and his justification through what Jesus did. And so it looks like every single day, day in and day out, confessing the sins of our hearts, what we've said, what we've done, even opening up those dark places and sharing with God our souls. He knows them anyway. So let us confess let us stand forgiven and free. And then friends, once we know the gospel deep in our hearts and we've confessed and repent of our sin, let us get to work. When Jesus left this earth, he told us to go and make disciples. That was not a suggestion. That was his command to us. And we are his disciples. We are his followers. We are agents of change, agents of shalom in this world of wholeness and peace. We are called to share the gospel, share this message, this good news that sin no longer holds us. We have no binds on us. We are free. And so we have to share it. We have to get to work, not just saying the words, but doing the good work. We are called to bring justice. We are called to bring freedom. We are called to bring compassion in a listening ear to our communities all of those things. Friends, this is a difficult time for our country, a difficult time for our world. And so we look at the problem of sin and all of the work that's happening in our world. We are being tested. And it's our faith, faith in a Jesus Christ who's done great things for us. It's gonna matter. As I was preparing for this sermon this morning, I actually, uh, one day this week, I sat down uh, outside the chapel to sit in the sun and try and calm my heart and gain some inspiration. Before I went outside, I grabbed a couple books off the shelf to read uh, this, this verse from Romans. And I grabbed a commentary that actually used to belong to my great-grandfather, my great-grandpa Ira. And as I sat down outside the chapel, I opened the book and a note fell out which I thought was interesting because I've used this book several times, but this note fell out. And it was actually something that he had written after he had talked with our pastor at the time. This is what it said. It said, Reverend Plough told us yesterday that we Christians can have peace in this troubled world. There are some other things that Christians have that the world knows nothing about. To me, the most cherished is hope. Later on on the note, quotes a verse on Romans 15, 13 that says this, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Systemic social change begins in our hearts. It begins in you, it begins in me. By allowing Jesus to hold a mirror to ourselves so that we might see the depth of our sin, but also that we might feel and know the depth of his love, the depth of his forgiveness. I see us, Faith Church, people who trust in Jesus, that as we confess our sin, that we might be able to get to work, that we might be able to bring real change. I have hope. I see hope. I know hope because I am hope because Jesus Christ lives in me. And so I have to do better. We have to do better. We have to lay down our sin, confess and accept that forgiveness, and let's get to work. Knowing that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ has forgiven us and that we can now bring change to this world. Let us pray. Holy Father, we come to you today knowing that there is a deficit. There is sin all over, Lord, and we come to you repenting of the sin in our own hearts, repenting of the sin in our lives so that we can bring that gospel message to the world. Lord, help us to see ourselves as we are, that by looking at the perfect of example of Jesus, we recognize the sins in our hearts, even the ones we 
we dare not utter. Lord, help us to lay them bare at your feet so that we can stand cleansed and free and start getting to work. It's going to take time and it's going to take effort, but Lord, we know that there is a route to peace and justice in this world and that we must follow you to get there. Father, we thank you. We thank you for all that you are and all that you've done in this world. And Lord, lead and guide us and help us to be agents of change in this world. In your blessed name we pray. Amen. Friends and family, thank you for joining us this morning. I want to remind you that next Sunday we will actually be meeting in person. In person, outside, in the north parking lot. Join us at 10 a.m. for our first outdoor service as we finally gather back together. I'm so looking forward to seeing all of you and sharing with you again. God bless and have a wonderful week.